We have with us uh, one of the candidates uh, running in um, Congressional District 5, Republican nominee Glow Smith, uh, Democratic uh, incumbent Congresswoman Corinne Brown uh, was invited uh, and would have appeared today, but or we intended her to, to appear today, but she turned down our uh, invitation. But we're uh, we're happy to have Glow Smith here. Um, we uh, start out all our um, campaign or candidate interviews with a couple of questions before we move on to uh, the substantive issues. Um, and we do this for everybody who comes in, um, no matter what level of race they're, uh, they're running for. And that is, uh, the first question is, have you ever been arrested before? No. Okay. Have you ever declared bankruptcy? No. Okay. Um, so you're running against a uh, incumbent who's been uh, representing the district or some form of the district now for uh, for over 20 years um, so why should uh, people in this district fire that incumbent fire that experienced incumbent and go for uh, for you having um, never served in Congress before well first of all they can look at the congresswoman's history of the last 20 years and ask themselves the question am I any better off is this district any better off and the answer to that is no Financially, we're not. Economically, we're not. With jobs, we're not. And what would you do to uh, make the district better off, to, make, to, to improve life for, for people in the district? One involves talking to our constituents and finding out what their issues are and what their needs are. And on a federal level, how do we address those needs? Because I believe that unlike the current representative, it's important that the constituents know that you are available and accessible and that you have an idea of what's happening in their lives as individuals. So we presume you've already been out there uh, pounding the pavement and knocking on doors. What are you hearing from the constituents about their needs? Number one, economic development and jobs. And we have been out for the last 15 months. And overwhelmingly, that's what we hear. They're concerned about how they're going to take care of their families. They're concerned about the fact that jobs are not coming to the 5th District. We may be bringing more jobs to Florida, but how many of those jobs are actually being located in the 5th District? So that's what I hear most of the time. So when Corinne's model says that Corinne delivers, you're saying she's not delivering that at least? Not as it stands for the district. If you look at our unemployment rate, we have one of the highest unemployment rates in the state of Florida out of all 27 districts. So um, her deliverables have not benefited the constituents. Look at the rate of constituents that are on entitlement programs that are having other issues that are paying high amount of taxes. The ones that are in a district that have not for whatever reason been able to qualify for Obamacare because they don't meet the minimum income requirements. So her deliverables have not benefited the constituents of this district. I've uh, reviewed your, your campaign website and uh, it's clear that, that you're a conservative, um, but are you advocating more federal spending not in the district? Of course not. Okay. Um, that would go against everything that I believe in. I believe that we government is too big right now. Uh, we have programs that need to be assessed and maybe even uh, withdrawn. How do we utilize some of the programs, cut out ways, and get services directly to our constituents is a huge issue for our country as a whole, not just this district. Do you have any particular programs in mind to put on the chopping block? Um, I wouldn't say specifically, but I believe that maybe a third of the federal governments and agencies, uh, government agencies that we have now, could easily be uh, demolished or taken away because they're redundant in services and they're not needed. Well, let's talk a little bit about you uh, personally. What leadership experience would you bring to the office? One, my uh, ability to work with constituents. I've done it for the last 30 years on local, state, and national levels, whether it was my service with Governor Scott or serving as a staff assistant to the lieutenant governor. Prior to that, I've worked in social services for almost 28 years now, and um, I know what it's 
means to provide services, to talk to your constituents and to talk to the people directly and to help them resolve their issues. It may not always be the answer that they need, but we can help bring some of their issues to a conclusion. Have you ever run for political office before? No. Um, I'm curious why you would you would aim so high in your first run for political office. Um, you know, often candidates start out uh, serving on city councils or school boards or in legislative offices before they move or they aim toward Congress. My whole life has been about aiming high. I've never been taught or was told or believe anyone should aim for anything lower. Um, I have the experience. I'm aiming for the job that's open uh, right now in this district as far as I'm concerned that needs to be filled, that needs to have a representative that is going to provide services and listen to the people. Um, I would tell anyone, especially in this district, that they should aim high. Part of our problem is people don't think outside the box. They're used to being told what they can and can't do and how high and how fast and where they can go and where they can grow. And my ideology is totally different. I believe people can be anything that they want to be. They have a right to not only professional but personal pro uh, prosperity. You've talked a lot already this morning about um, economic recovery and economic development in this particular district. What do you see as the biggest hurdle to economic recovery in the district and how would you tackle that? Well, there's several things that's happening. One is do we have the workforce that's qualified and ready to work? I believe we do. Two, are we going to be able to have businesses come that are going to be able to bring jobs, respectable jobs, not necessarily high-paying jobs, but entry-level jobs to high-paying jobs to the district and have a workforce that's ready, willing, and able to work? And then the other part is how do we make sure that we're uh, not strangling these businesses? And not only that, but we're encouraging our own cit uh, citizens and constituents to become entrepreneurs and business owners themselves. So I think that it starts there. And what does the federal government do to encourage uh, people to be entrepreneurial and start small businesses? I'm not sure what they're doing. I know uh, what they're doing that hurts that, and that's uh -huh. the business regulations, that's the taxes. That's all the things that are really discouraging to business. That's including Obamacare or the Affordable Health Care Act. There are just too many things that the federal government are doing. They need to move out of the way so small businesses can grow, and the people in this district definitely can have the opportunity to start their own business. You mentioned uh, people not making enough to qualify for health insurance subsidies. Um, that sounds like an argument for expanding Obamacare instead of getting rid of Definitely it. Definitely not. Mm -hmm. I would not argue to ever expand Obamacare. Uh, I don't think, one, personally, the government should have the uh, strangle that they currently have on this health care system, the taking over the economy, one six of this economy. You know, if Obamacare is for everyone, then over 18, why is over 1,800 waivers been issued? Um, you know, so we've got to really look at this program. What does it do? It discourages growth. Um, people are not able to uh, qualify for whatever reason. Then other people are getting waivers. Um, I would never uh, advocate for expanding Obamacare. I think the private industry work well. There are so many other things we can do. We can open it up to cross state lines. There are some things in Obamacare that are okay. Um, you know, I, I have pre-existing conditions, so I understand that very clearly. I have young children and, and grown adults, and I understand what it is when they have insurance or not have insurance. I understand that. So um, I would definitely um, completely uh, vote to, if not repeal, then definitely to replace and defund Obamacare. Mm -hmm. What would you replace it with? Well, there are some great plans out there that's been introduced by the government, and then I think that we bring it to the people. The transparency and the creation of Obamacare was not part of what the people wanted in the state. A lot of them didn't know what was happening, and they definitely were not involved. So we bring it to the people to ask what they want, and we allow the state governments and private industry to work together. You said the government has some great plans. What specific plans? I said, you no, I didn't say the government had okay. great plans. Right, I right. said there are some plans that have been introduced by Republicans. There are several out there. And I think that well, we need to. One well, I, I, I don't yeah. want to talk about one specifically. Okay. But what I am but saying. You're talking in, in generality, so it, we need to know what specifically you would think would replace Obamacare. And I would not say that right now because, as I said before, I believe that we should allow people an opportunity 
to look at what we have and what we need and what they want. But you so, yourself has said these plans are great. So clearly, there are some you plans have a specific that I think, opinion about something that would right. work. And so again, let's hear what would work. Well, again, I uh, will say what I just said. What I think is not what's the most important thing. What my constituents think and what the people of America think is, and unlike so many other politicians or statesmen, I don't want to forge my opinion and my thought and my belief on them. I want people to have the opportunity to learn for themselves and to identify what they want for themselves. So no, how, no matter how many times you ask me that question, it's the same thing. I have my ideas about a lot of different things. But again, I'm here, unlike our Congresswoman, to talk to our people and to listen to what they want. Do you think the majority of uh, constituents in District 5 would be opposed to uh, Obamacare, would want to get rid of Obamacare? The people that I've talked to, rather from all parties, have serious concerns about Obamacare at some point. So whether it's repealing it, defunding it, or replacing it, keeping maybe what work or what they like about it, and figuring out a better system, again, allowing it to be um, people to buy insurance across state lines and looking at other issues. Um, you know, the taxes that are coming with Obamacare, people were not prepared for that. They didn't understand that. And I think that those are issues that we have to continue to educate people on and give them the opportunity to have the transparency that the, um, the not only the Congresswoman supported, but the President said what happened with this entire plan. As you know, it was passed, and not only that, Congress didn't know what was in it. So I think that's wrong, and that's why, again, I will not say what I want. I want to know what the people want. I want them to have an opportunity to see for themselves and to decide for themselves what's going to be good for their families. If you were elected to office, would you vote to raise the federal minimum wage? No, I would not. Why not? Because I believe that there are entry-level jobs, and those are exactly what they are, entry-level jobs. I think everyone has an opportunity to advance. Um, there are a lot of different um, issues that we have to address with minimum wage. What are you going to do with uh, people who have college degrees and college loans to pay back that also go to an entry-level job or maybe even a mid-level job and don't make $15 an hour? So it's not just the entry-level jobs that are uh, we're talking about or we should be talking about. It's the entire system and how is it going to affect the entire country and what does that mean for businesses and what does that mean for individuals? Would you uh, vote for any tax increases? Of course not. Have you signed a pledge from uh, Americans for Tax Reform opposing any tax increases? I can't tell you I have. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. I get quite a few things to pledge and doc uh, sign. I just can't remember, remember yeah. it offhand. What if, what if the, the tax increase were, what, what if it were a revenue increase from closing a tax loophole that a uh, particular industry was taking advantage of? Would I what? Would you support uh, additional revenue through closing no, tax I would loopholes? No, I would not support any additional revenue through any tax means by increasing the tax. The government takes in enough taxes as it is. What I would support is reducing taxes, definitely supporting uh, anything other than the current tax system that we have, whether it's the fair tax or um, some other plan that may come about. One of the critiques of, from opponents of the fair tax is that it would increase the tax burden, it would shift the tax burden from upper incomes to middle and lower incomes. Um, how would you, uh, I mean, how do you think that would go over in, in District 5? Um, probably exactly the same way it's going over now, as we all know. The middle class has experienced tax increases. I mean, you could just look at the tax increases with Obamacare alone. Mm -hmm. So they're they're having that issue right now to face every single day. It's real to them. Taxes, they're paying taxes that they never thought they would be paying. And so, uh, again, using just Obamacare as one example, uh, we cannot continue to expect people to pay taxes when we're not bringing in creating more jobs. We're not bringing in economic, we're not growing economically in our country, but we're continuing to tax the same people. And so I think for, for the constituents in this district, definitely, um, they are paying taxes now. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't the fair tax make it worse on those constituents since they pay a greater portion of their income for the kind of purchases that would be subject to a 
I think what the fair tax do, everyone will be paying tax. And what's hurting people now is what's happening right now. I have to deal with the reality of what we have. We don't have the fair tax. I support the fair tax. But the reality is our tax system right now are hurting my constituents and hurting people in this country. Immigration has been a big issue in the news lately. Um, we're wondering where you stand on reforming immigration policy here in the United States. Um, do you support a path to citizenship? Do you support amnesty? Where do you stand on No, I don't. This? What is your plan for immigration? I believe that immigration um, in our system as it exists now needs to be reformed. I'm very concerned about not only the new issues that have come up in the last uh, six months, but I'm concerned with other uh, administrative orders that the President has signed relating to immigrants and, and, and the legal system and what's happening with Border Patrol. You know, I'm married to a law enforcement. He's been in law enforcement for 31 years. I understand what his job is. It concerns me that our Border Patrol agents are becoming babysitters and not doing their job. It concerns me that we are allowing people in this country right now in my district, again, we have a great deal of our constituents that are entitlement programs. You know, I've worked in the child welfare system. I understand what it is to be, uh, to receive relative caregiver payment and foster care payment. When I look at what's happening and the amount of money that we are now paying people to take care of these children that have entered our country illegally, thousands of dollars more. It bothers me. I am an American first person. I don't apologize for that. I think we take care of home. People in my district definitely need uh, money. I don't know if it should come, and I don't believe it should come from the federal government, but I do have a problem with what's happening. I think that as far as countries like Mexico is concerned and every other country these children are coming from, that we need to start sending them huge IOU bills. The American taxpayer should not be funding this humanity, humanitarian crisis that I believe has been created um, for whatever reason to uh, bring other children, and, and not only that, uh, adults that are coming, uh, the security issues, the health issues, I don't think that we should have to fund that. And I think that we should say to Mexico, not another dollar of American money will be sent to you, and additionally, we will, owe, we will send you a bill for these children, and we will send you a bill for every dollar that the taxpayers are paying. What do you think that the President and Congress should do in the short term to deal with the crisis on the border? I don't know what the President wants to do. I know what he has done. It's not working. I do not like the idea that he thinks it's okay to wait until after this election in November to perhaps sign an administrative order. I just think that Congress needs to step up to the plate and that we need to, again, think about America first, what's in America's best interest and how do we get the citizen involved in this situation. Um, it's a huge undertaking for us. Immigration reform threatens, I think, so many areas of our lives as Americans that we have to all get involved in and take it seriously. You had said earlier that you thought about a third of the federal government was probably redundant and could be, uh, could be shut down. Does that apply to um, the military? Not at all. I believe that we must, we must completely fund our military and support our military, and additionally our veterans. So you wouldn't advocate any cuts in, in not, defense spending? Not at all. Are you um, satisfied with the state of race relations in America right now? And I guess we asked this question in the wake of the Michael Brown incident in Ferguson. You know, as sad as that case is, the reality is for me that every day in this district, young kids are dying. That's the reality. I can't think about what's happening as a mom of two boys and, again, married to a law enforcement officer. Um, my heart aches for that situation. But what I know is the reality is in my district, children are dying every single day. People are dying every single day somewhere in this district, somewhere in our state. And to me, again, we've got to look at what's happening in our own backyard. And, and if we're going to talk about race, the reality is we have a lot of black-on-black -black crime that our president definitely don't talk about. The congresswoman sure uh, we don't speak of unless it's racially, you know, high-profile racial case. So I'm, I'm concerned about that. Do you support affirmative action? Uh, you know, um, that's one of those things where there are some some components of affirmative action that I would consider supporting, but overall do we still need it in several areas? I believe that we've come really a long way, um, and I think that, you know, we have to look at the progress that has been made and look at areas and assess areas. Uh, one of the things that we knew had to happen with this campaign early on was that it had to be about education. 
It had to be about educating individuals on the issues and the things that are important to them and their families and their communities. And part of that is not only um, affirmative action, it could be um, voter right, it could be uh, as it relates to job or anything else, is that we've got to make sure that we assess where we are now. One of the things that I know this Congresswoman likes to do, and so many people who think like her, is to use race as a way to divide us. I think we've come so far. I know personally my children are growing up with people of all races, and that's not the first thing. Again, when I'm out there, I said this Monday night when I was in Gainesville, and I've been saying it from day one, people are not talking to me about race. They're talking to me about real issues, how they're going to take care of their families, where are the jobs that were promised, how are we going to become um, economically sound and empower people in this district and help them to understand that, one, they can do better, they should do better, and we can help them do better. District 5 is a heavily, based on registration, it's a heavily democratic district. Um, what for a democratic voter, what, what should persuade a democratic voter to, uh, to cross party lines and vote for you? You know what, I, I think, you know, for me, I tell people to vote their values, and to me that's not a party thing. You see, there are people in all parties that have values that uh, may or may not agree with mine. I definitely know what mine are. And I tell people to vote their values, and if that means you have to vote across party line or you should feel free to vote across party line, then that's what they do. My message is the same for all of our constituents. I really uh, don't spend time thinking about the color of your skin or your political party. What I'm saying to people is when I'm out there and I'm meeting families, I can't tell you a hungry Democratic child from a Republican child. I can't tell you a jobless, a family that's jobless and that have other needs. I can't look at you and say, well, that's a Republican and they got this issue and that's a Democrat or that's a third party and they have that issue. For us, the constituents are having the same problems. And again, it's about jobs, economic development, it's about the security of our country, it's about the taxes that they're paying, you know, it's about what's happening with the crime in our community. And, you know, I, it's, it's really funny because I have so many people, well, I shouldn't say so many, I get quite a few emails and calls from people who say um, it's very specifically about this district, what's your message to the black people who keep voting for Corinne Brown? Or what's your message to the Democrats? My message is the same for all of our people. I want to run to represent all the constituents in District 5, and I don't have one particular message that I write to any group of people. Should the uh, government be do doing more to close the gap between the rich and the poor in this country? I think the government needs to be doing a whole lot less. Our government is out of control and it's too big. Uh, the government cannot close the gap between the richest and the poor because if that was the case, then why are so many, especially under this current president, our current president, why are so many people on receiving food stamps? The gap has not closed. The very people that they said and, you know, we believe that they want to help and bring up are being hurt. So less government. You mentioned on your website uh, reforming entitlement programs. Um, what do you have in mind? Well, one, uh, first of all, let's look at them and let's talk about the truth of the matter. Entitlement programs from the very beginning were never designed to strengthen the family. In fact, they were designed to destroy the family. Very specifically, they told us that our husbands and the fathers of our children could not be in our home. They rewarded women for having more babies. The more you had, the more money you got and the longer you could stay on it. It wasn't until 87 when we had uh, welfare reform um, that President Clinton signed into um, law that really was pushed and led by the Republicans. Um, that we even address the issue to say that you cannot continue to have all of these babies and expect the American taxpayer to pay for you. These programs may have started out in, in, in some instances to help, but what they have grown into is a dependency that we see that is generational. I meet families every day, not just in this district, but around the country and around the state, that it's generational. Their parents were on food stamps or government assistance, they're on it, their children are on it, and maybe even their grandparents. So, you know, it goes back to education. The entitlement programs are designed to keep you at a level. There is not one program that exists right now that will allow anyone on them to build wealth. That's a problem. That's a problem for the black community, very specifically in this district, because we understand, as we see it, we understand that that wealth gap has decreased for African Americans or black Americans. So that's an issue, too. They're designed to hold you still. You can't, right now, get a great job and get on entitlement programs or have entitlement programs to some degree. You know, if you go in and you requalify or you 
uh, alert the agencies that you have had some changes in your situation. Uh, honestly, in the last five years, you've been able to maintain that same level. So my idea is I understand them. I was born to a mom that was on welfare. I understand what government commodities are because we had them. I know what it's like to stand in line and wait for them because we did. I understand also what it's like to be empowered and to be told that, you know what, you don't have to stay here. This is going to limit you and your ability to do and to do, to do and be the thing, uh, I'm sorry, to do what you want to do and to be who you want to be. So we've got to reform these programs, but not only that, it's really sad right now in our country, we don't have programs in place that will gradually, over a certain period of time, eliminate these programs out of one's life. Right now, if the system worked and everyone was doing what they were supposed to be doing, uh, if you had changes in your income or situation, you may lose all of your benefits. So, you know, on one hand, people go out and they get jobs, but if you're getting 15 to $20 average between all the entitlement programs that um, several people receive, then it would be crazy for them to say, I'm going to give up all of these for this job. So we've got to make sure that we have a gradual step-down program that will allow people to get a job and maybe cut benefits over a period of time. And for me, I think that's five to ten years, especially in District 5 and, and in the state of Florida where, again, so many of our constituents have been on entitlement programs for, you know, a long, long time. So you would, um, I guess, decrease the number of supporter programs, but maybe ramp up the number of job training programs, that sort of thing. Well, you know, what's really um, interesting about that is, yeah, I definitely would decrease um, some of the current programs, but gradually decrease people off of programs. But there are so many job programs that currently exist, and the problem become who's assessing those programs to see if they're working, who's getting a job. I know personally when um, I didn't have a job, and you know, I went through a work source, and you know, I did everything I was supposed to do, and it was really hard to get a job. But who is there to say we have put this amount of money into these programs, especially for low-income people? But what's the turnout? How many people are actually getting a job? We're spending millions of dollars. Again, there is some waste there, and there's no accountability. And I think that's part of the problem: is that we've got to hold people accountable, and we've got to see. You know, why do we have to wait for? some huge story to be revealed or some scandal to be revealed before we assess government agencies. Um, right now we're spending uh, millions and millions of dollars on job programs throughout this entire country to help people get a job, you know, and to help people get off of government assistance. But the reality is where are those true job numbers to say certain a certain amount of people have gone through this program and successfully completed and at the end of the day they have a job that maybe not maybe it's not 100 percent sustainable for their families but it's definitely moved them in the right direction to get off of government assistance okay we're just about out of time Jean. no way <laughs> oh are you kidding me <laughs> was there any uh, any uh, issue or, or topic that we didn't bring up that you wanted to uh, give us your position on? Well, I, I think overall, you know, I, I would tell people to get to know who I am and why I'm running, to understand that I've always lived in this district. I'm passionate about this district. I know firsthand what uh, we are capable of doing. And to give me a chance, what I do know is what's happened in the last 20 years and the representative we've had in the last 20 years has not been beneficial to District 5. And so I believe it's time for a change. I believe a change is coming, and I believe I am the person to represent all of the constituents in this district and to help us move forward. Because, you know, when you've got 27 districts in the state of Florida and you're not in the top five, that's a problem. And I know the people in this district deserve more and they're better than that. And so I would say, you know, talk to me, you know, get involved with our campaign, find out what we're about. Make a decision now to take control of what's happening in your own life as an individual and then again in our families and our communities and definitely in our state and country. Um, this campaign honestly is not about me, Glow Smith, as an individual. It's about me being the face of all the constituents out there and the, the face of the constituents in District 5 who has a hope and a desire to be more and to, to see our country prosperous and, and not only that but to actively be involved. So it's about educating themselves on the issues, knowing what their values are understanding that it's okay it's okay to believe things that you believe and you don't have to be sold out to your party 
that you vote your values at the end of the day, that you identify the true needs, you assess what's going on in your life and your community, and you say, you know what, it's time for a change. We, we can do better. We must do better, and we will do better. Well, thank you so much for coming in today, and Thank good you. luck with your campaign. Thank you very much for having me.